So now let me get started with the material. So, um, uh, so this is a joint work with Boris Botvinnik from the University of Oregon, who I think is actually uh, here today, and Paolo Piazza from Rome. And we have one paper on the archive, and there's another one that will be posted very soon. Um, so let me get started here. So um, I'm going to be talking about uh, scalar curvature. Um, I'm assuming most people know what that is. But um, in case you don't, it's the simplest curvature invariant you can define for a Riemannian manifold. And roughly speaking, it measures whether um, in a small neighborhood of a point, the uh, curvature of a G of a, uh, a ball of radius R is, I mean, sorry, it measures the, whether the volume of a ball of radius R is uh, smaller or bigger than what it would be in Euclidean space. So um, it's uh, officially defined as the double contraction of the curvature tensor or uh, what you do to evaluate it is to sum up all the uh, sectional curvatures in all the two planes spanned by uh, a local orthonormal frame. And uh, when you do this, uh, it turns out this, the curvature, the scalar curvature of a standard round sphere of radius one is L times L minus one. So this number will actually play a role a little later. That's why I'm mentioning it. Um, then a, um, a spin structure on an oriented Riemannian manifold is a lifting of the orthonormal frame bundle, which is a principal SON bundle to a principal bundle for the double cover of the orthogonal group, that's the spin group. And it's well known that the obstruction to a spin structure is a second steeple whitney class, which lives in H upper two with uh, Z mod two coefficients. And the set of all spin structures uh, is a principal homogeneous space for H upper one with Z mod two coefficients. That means that this group over here acts simply transitively on the set of spin structures, although there's no canonical base point. All right, now, um, let's uh, go on to uh, the basic uh, topic of this uh, talk, which has to do with when something has positive scalar curvature or not. So, um, so uh, before I get to that, uh, when you have a spin structure on a manifold, then you can define something called the Dirac operator. Most of you probably know about this. If you don't, uh, you can just take it as a kind of a black box as something that comes with a spin structure. Uh, but it's an elliptic differential operator, and it has an index, and the index of this operator um, can be defined in a refined sense to take values in the group KO lower n, where KO means real K theory. So the group KO lower n is, um, it's, uh, 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 infinite cyclic for n divisible by four and in z mod two when n is one or two mod eight and otherwise it's zero. So uh, you have this thing called the alpha invariant of m which is the index of the Dirac operator and it turns out that this alpha invariant only depends on the spin bordism class and the alpha invariant in fact can uh, be generalized to a map from the set of bordism classes of spin manifolds, that's the spin bordism, uh, omega spin, to K theory KO. Now, um, the important thing about the Dirac operator from our point of view is this uh, theorem of Lichnerowitz back from the 1960s that if you take the Dirac operator and square it, what you get is something that looks like a Laplacian plus the scalar curvature divided by four. So a consequence of that is that if the scalar curvature is strictly positive, then this term over here is strictly positive. This term over here is of course 
uh, greater than or equal to zero in terms of its uh, spectral properties. So then that means that the square or the Dirac operator is bounded away from zero, so all its index invariants vanish. And so if you have a closed spin manifold, then alpha of m has to be zero. And that means that if alpha of m is non-zero, then m cannot have a Ramanian metric of positive scalar curvature. So this was the first result that showed that the question of positive scalar curvature is interesting. Now in high dimensions, there's also a converse, at least if you stick to simply connected manifolds. For manifolds with fundamental group, uh, it's a kind of a complicated story, which I don't want to get into today. But um, here's the basic result, which is due, a uh, large part of it is due to Gromov and Lawson, and then Stoltz uh, contributed a very important piece uh, somewhat later. So if you have a closed simply connected manifold of dimension greater than or equal to five, this, this theorem, by the way, fails in dimension four because of the peculiarities of four manifolds, which again, I don't want to get into, but anyway, so if M does not admit a uh, spin structure, then N always has a metric of positive scalar curvature. There's no obstruction. Uh, notice the Dirac operator is only defined in the spin case. So when there's no spin structure, there's no Dirac operator. So this theorem here doesn't say anything. And in that case, you always have a metric of positive scalar curvature. Uh, but if M does admit a spin structure, then since it's simply connected, the spin structure is unique and M admits a PSC metric. Uh, PSC is just my shorthand for positive scalar curvature, if and only if alpha of M is equal to zero in this group KON. All right, so um, let me say a little bit about where this came from because some of the ingredients will show up later. So the first big ingredient is this theorem, the Bordism theorem of Gromov and Lawson. So suppose you have two closed spin manifolds of the same dimension. And let's say for simplicity that M is simply connected. You can, there's a generalization of this one. That's not the case. And you have a spin bordism from M prime to M. That means you have a, a spin manifold with boundary one dimension higher that has M prime and M as its boundary components. So the M prime doesn't have to be simply connected and doesn't even have to be connected, but the, the M is simply connected. Okay, and then the theorem says that if M prime has a PSC metric, then you can push that metric across the bordism, so to speak, and get a PSC metric on M. And this also works when M and M prime are not necessarily, when, well, here you have to assume that M is, really is non-spin. Okay, so in other words, W2 of M is non-zero. But if M is non-spin and M prime is just not necessarily spin, and M is simply connected, then the same theorem works for just an ordinary board, oriented bordism. Okay, so that was the first big ingredient, and that enabled Gromov and Lawson to prove the non-spin case of the theorem and to prove a good part of the spin case, but they couldn't quite construct PSC matrix on all the generators of spin boredism, just a good fraction of them. So the uh, ingredient that Stoltz used to finish the problem off was to find a method for constructing PSC metrics on enough spin manifolds to generate the kernel of the alpha invariant. You see, if, the, if something is not in the kernel of the alpha invariant, this is the spin bordism group. So if something's not in the kernel of the alpha invariant, then Dirac has a non-zero index, so it can't possibly have a PSC metric and you don't have to worry about it. But if something is in the kernel of the uh, alpha invariant, then Stoltz showed that you can basically construct this <coughs> bordism class using bundles that have uh, fiber, the quaternionic projective space, HP2, and since this is a nice Riemannian symmetric space of positive curvature, uh, that uh, shows you that you get a PSC metric, at least on something in the Bordism class, and then you use the uh, Bordism theorem over here to, uh, to get it on your actual manifold. All right, so that's the 
that's the method of proof. Now, um, what I want to talk about today is a generalization to pseudo-manifolds. So what is a pseudo-manifold? Pseudo-manifold is some kind of stratified space, M sigma, that sigma stands for stratification, just to kind of remind you that it's not an ordinary manifold. Um, and what that means is that you have a dense open subset, which is a nice manifold, and then there are smaller strata that are manifolds of positive codimension. And there are lots of categories of these things, but here we'll consider the case where this space is compact and there are only two strata. So there's a, an open stratum, which is smooth, and then there is a closed stratum, which is a submanifold of positive codimension. Uh, but uh, the behavior near that submanifold might be singular looking. Uh, we'll see what we mean by that in a moment. Um, so what we're going to try to do is to find an analog of the theorem of Gromov, Lawson, and Stoltz for this situation uh, in the case where things are spin and simply connected and the dimension is high enough. Okay, now why would you want to do analysis on pseudomanifolds? Uh, so these pseudomanifolds in general have singularities, which may be not so bad, they may be really bad. Um, but examples of spaces that, you know, come up a lot that are pseudomanifolds are complex algebraic varieties or complex analytic spaces, or the spaces that were used by Sullivan and Bose to model cycles in homology theory. So there are all kinds of reasons why you might want to consider these things. They do come up in lots of applications. All right, so uh, today we'll just talk about uh, kind of simple kinds of stratified spaces, which are called Tom Mather stratified spaces of depth one. So you have an open stratum, which is a nice smooth manifold M open circle here. Um, and then there's a distinguished closed stratum, which we'll write beta, beta M, um, which is a closed manifold of lower dimension. And the requirement is that this beta M inside M sigma has a tubular neighborhood that's a fiber bundle with fibers that are the cones on some other manifold called the link. Okay, in other words, in a neighborhood of beta M, you have this tubular neighborhood N, which looks locally like beta M uh, in one direction and looks like the cone on L in the other direction. Okay, and so this is a called an, a manifold with fibered L singularities because each of the uh, you know, the, the, the link of the singularity is L, all right? Now you can desingularize this thing by cutting it open along the singular stratum. In other words, taking out the neighborhood of the uh, singular set. And then you get a compact smooth manifold, which has a boundary. And that's called the resolution. Uh, let's call that M. And then this has the property that the boundary of M fibers over beta M with fibers that look like L. And then if you were to collapse the boundary of M to beta M via this process, then uh, topologically you just get it, you get back to this M sigma. All right, so for example, if you have uh, something like an algebraic variety with a point singularity, uh, that's exactly of this type, um, and there the, um, the beta M would just be a point, okay? Now, um, so once again, the M sigma looks like M with this tubular neighborhood adjoined along the boundary of M, and we'll think of beta M as the Bockstein by analogy with certain other things that come up in algebraic topology. Um, but if you don't assume anything else, then it's very hard to study these things because the, uh, the geometric structure 
it can be very complicated. So we're going to look at a more rigid kind of situation, which we'll call the LG fibered case. So that means that we want to assume that the link L is a homogeneous space of a compact Lie group. And the bundle just comes by taking a, uh, from boundary of M down to beta M, just comes from taking a principal G bundle over beta M and dividing out by this uh, subgroup H. So then, uh, you notice L being a homogeneous space, it has a G invariant metric, um, and that uh, invariant metric will have constant scalar curvature. And um, while you could study, for example, the case where uh, G is uh, the circle group, um, then uh, you get something that has a very different kind of flavor from what we're going to talk about today. Uh, Boris Botvinnik and I actually did study that case, but today I want to talk about the case where G is a compact semi-simple group, like, uh, you know, unitary group or orthogonal group or something like that. So uh, let's assume that G is compact and simply connected. And uh, then the L is also simply connected. And so cases uh, of interest are the case where L is a sphere, or L is a complex or a quaternionic projective space, or where the L is actually equal to G and the H is trivial. And since G is compact semi-simple, then the GL always has positive scalar curvature in this case. And the scalar curvature is everywhere constant. Um, and the G invariant metric on L if G is simple, is uniquely defined up to a scaling factor, so you can rescale it uh, in a way. I'll, sh I'll show you what the best rescaling is in a moment. And uh, we'll assume that M and beta M are both simply connected in spin, just so everything is back like the situation of the original gromov lawson theorem. So, um, we're only going to want to talk about special Riemannian metrics on this singular space, those that are well adapted to the special structure around the singular set. So uh, let me explain what I mean by that. Uh, notice if L is equal to a sphere, then the cone on a sphere is a disk. So M sigma actually is a, a smooth manifold, but we're interested just in metrics that have a very special form. So this, these are the properties we want. On the tubular neighborhood of beta M, which is a fiber bundle over beta M with fibers, the cone on L uh, and structure group G. So there you want a, a Riemannian submersion down to beta M for some metric on beta M. And then you use a uh, connection on the G principal bundle um, to lift the metric downstairs uh, up to the horizontal fibers of the connection. And you make those orthogonal to a metric that looks like this. So this is a conical metric on the conical fibers. So why am I using this particular form, dr squared plus r squared gl? Well, think about the case where L is equal to the sphere. So then the cone on a sphere is a disk. So uh, what you see over, and gl here is the standard metric on the sphere. So what you see here is just the usual metric on Euclidean space written in polar coordinates. R is the polar coordinate. Right, so you have dr squared and r squared times the uh, metric on the uh, spheres. So we normalize GL to have scalar curvature equal to the scalar curvature of the sphere. And that way, when you use the formula for computing the curvature of a warp product metric like that, it turns out that the vertical fibers of this uh, neighborhood of the singular set are actually scalar flat, just as they would be in the case of a sphere. Remember, if you had a L or a sphere, then the cone on a sphere is a disk, and this metric over here is the Euclidean metric, 
and the same thing happens here. So the scalar curvature of the, the vertical fibers is zero. And also with all these special geometric assumptions, we've arranged for the vertical fibers to be totally geodesic. So it's kind of very nice kind of metric, which is sort of flat in the vertical direction from the point of view of scalar curvature. And then we have whatever curvature you have on beta M down on the base. Then on M, which is the complement of the neighborhood of beta M, you smooth out the G invariant metric on L. Um, um, to get a, a metric on boundary M, which uh, is then a product metric on um, Actually, this, this over here, instead of L, this should say boundary M, sorry. You want the G invariant metric on boundary M to extend to a product metric on a, a collar neighborhood, and then, then you extend it to all of them. And you have to transition from the warp product to the uh, flat product, but anyway, that, you, you can do that in a sort of nice canonical way. So here's the basic question. Suppose you have one of these pseudo-manifolds with the LG fibered singularities, um, and it comes from all this structure, which is fairly rigid. So you have the M, you have the boundary M fibering down to beta M, and remember that this thing comes from a principal bundle over uh, beta M with uh, group G, and boundary M is just what you get from that principal bundle by dividing out by some subgroup. So suppose the M and the beta M are simply connected in spin. When does this thing adapt, admit an adapted metric of positive scalar curvature adapted in the sense of the previous slide? Okay, so here's the basic theorem. First of all, there are two obstructions to being able to do this. Uh, and they both come from index theory. So, one is the index of the Dirac operator on box. So that's this alpha of beta M. The dimension of beta M is N, that's the dimension of M minus L, which is the dimension of L minus one. And then there's another index invariant, which we'll call the cylindrical alpha invariant. And the way you define that is as follows. You take this manifold M, Remember, its boundary has positive scalar curvature because it's, you know, it's fibered with fibers that look like L. So, so you take uh, boundary M cross an infinite, uh, half infinite uh, ray and uh, you take the product metric on this cylinder. So you just take the, the, the metric that you had on M and extend it over the cylinder. And now you take the uh, Dirac operator on this thing. Now, uh, this has positive scalar curvature on the end. And the only place where the scalar curvature might be non-zero is, I mean, might, might be a negative is somewhere in here. So uh, that you can check that that implies that the Dirac operator is still Fredholm still has a well-defined index and that gives you this cylindrical alpha invariant. So this lies in KON where the N is the same dimension as M. Okay, so now the, the, uh, the proof of that is straightforward but not completely trivial. You have to do some calculations with the uh, O'Neill formulas for Riemannian submergence to check that having PSC on M sigma implies you have PSC on the base. So that's what gives you the vanishing of the alpha invariant to beta M. And then uh, to check that, you actually have to properly normalize the radii of the cones. So I didn't talk about how to do that. That's still another constant you have to set correctly. Um, and then as I mentioned, the the fact that the alpha invariant for the, uh, the cylindrical manifold here is uh, well-defined comes from the fact that you have positive scalar curvature on the cylindrical end. 
And obviously, if you had cylindrical, if you had positive scalar curvature everywhere, then the Dirac operator would be bounded away from zero everywhere on the whole manifold, and so the this alpha invariant would be zero. So that's why this is also an obstruction. So you have two obstructions here. So both of these have to vanish in order for M sigma to admit a metric of positive scalar curvature. Now, what we want is a converse to that. So we want to find a necessary and sufficient condition to have one of these adapted PSC methods. So how are you gonna get a converse? Well, here's the converse theorem. So let's suppose you have one of these LG fibered pseudomanifolds and the M and the beta M are simply connected in spin, and the L and the G are simply connected. So then the vanishing of the two index obstructions is necessary and sufficient, provided that N is greater than or equal to L plus six, and one of the following two additional conditions holds. So this, this, uh, this condition over here uh, is put in in order to assure that beta m has dimension at least five. Okay, so what are the additional conditions? One is that L is what's called a spin PSC G boundary. I'll explain what that means in a moment. And then there's another one that the Bordism class of the map from beta m to BG which uh, classifies the principal G bundle over beta M that defines the LG fibered structure, you want this Bordism class to vanish in the spin Bordism group of BG. So if either of these conditions holds and you have the dimension condition, then the vanishing of the index obstructions is not only necessary but also sufficient. So uh, let me explain how we actually prove this theorem. So first of all, I have to explain what that uh, spin PSCG boundary meant. So this was uh, one of the conditions you could assume. So that means that this L, the link, is the boundary of some other manifold L prime, which also has a G structure. Um, now, G acts transitively on L, doesn't have to act transitively on L bar. But L is the boundary of another G manifold where the L bar has a metric of positive scalar curvature that's a product in the neighborhood of the boundary. And this condition of being a spin PSC G boundary holds if G is a simply connected Lie group, or if L is a sphere, or if L is an odd dimensional complex projective space. You might ask, well, what happened to the even dimensional complex projective spaces? Well, those aren't spins, so uh, they don't really fall into the framework we're talking about. Uh, second condition was that this uh, beta M to BG was equal to zero in spin boardism, and that's satisfied when boundary M splits as a product of beta M and L, and L is an even quaternionic projective space. The case of uh, odd quaternionic projective spaces is not totally clear, but of course the first odd quaternionic projective space is HP1, which is the same as S4, so that was actually covered in the other case. Uh, I don't, we don't really know about the others, but anyway. So this already covers a lot of the situations that I mentioned at the beginning where L is either G itself or it's a sphere or a projective space. So the dimension restriction N greater than or equal to L plus six is needed because we need to apply bordism and surgery methods. And for that, we wanna basically use the idea of the gromov lawson theorem, which used surgery theory in dimension greater than or equal to five. So, if you don't have this, then you really can't get anywhere. Okay, so uh, that's where the dimension condition came in. So 
as I mentioned, we're going to use Bordism methods, so we have to explain what the Bordism theory is here. So we have to set up the right kind of Bordism theory. So what do we mean by a Bordism of pseudomanifolds? Well, um, you take your pseudomanifolds and you resolve them, and you have these resolutions M and M prime, and then the Bordism is really a Bordism with corners of this thing. So here's a, here's a picture, a sort of schematic picture. Here's M prime with its boundary, and here's M with its boundary. And then the boundary, the, the, the thing that boards, that uh, constitutes the Bordism between M and M prime is this uh, sheet that sort of goes across here, this W, which is actually a manifold with corners, you can see that. Um, and its boundary has two pieces. There's one piece that consists of M and M prime, and then there's another piece that's a ordinary spin boardism between boundary M and boundary M prime. Okay, so that's, this is the usual meaning of boardism of pseudo manifolds. This has been studied by topologists before so this is not really a new concept, but that's the picture you want to keep in mind. So uh, then we want to build in the LG fibered structure. And then when you do that, you get uh, bordism groups that fit into a long exact sequence. So uh, the long exact sequence looks like this. Here's this mysterious uh, bordism group of LG fibered singular manifolds of dimension N. This is the usual spin bordism group in dimension N, and this is the spin bordism in dimension N minus L minus one of BG. And here, uh, it's easy to explain what these maps are. So I is simply the map that you get by thinking of a closed manifold as a pseudo manifold with empty singularity. So obviously you have a map from here to here. Uh, beta is the Bockstein map. You take your M sigma, and you map it, its Bordism class, the class of beta M going to BG corresponding to the principal G bundle that defines the LG fibered structure. And then tau would be the map that sends this thing to the class of boundary M, the, the L bundle over beta M. So this, uh, this map tau increases dimension uh, so this goes to omega n minus one spin. So the map tau increases dimension by L, the map beta decreases dimension by L plus one, and the map I preserves dimension. So um, it's not terribly difficult to check that you get a long exact sequence this way. For example, it's obvious that if you take this map and compose with that, then that sends you from the class of M sigma to the class of boundary M, but the class of boundary M is zero in spin bordism because boundary M by definition is the boundary of M. Okay, so, uh, so there are similar kinds of arguments. And similarly, if you take I and compose it with beta, then you get zero because this thing had no boundary. So therefore this, this, uh, this thing over here is the empty set and so on. So it's very easy to check the, uh, that you have a, uh, uh, a long exact sequence. I mean, proving the other directions is just a little bit more difficult, but that, that's fairly straightforward. So once you have the right definitions, the exact sequence sort of follows right away. Now, the key ingredient in the proof of the main theorem is gonna be a Bordism theorem, which is modeled on the gromov lawson Bordism theorem. So uh, let's take two LG fibered spin pseudomanifolds of dimension n greater than or equal to L plus six that represent the same class. And uh, we make the same assumptions we had all along. And then the theorem says that if M prime sigma has a well adapted PSC, G, uh, PSC metric, then you can push it through the bordism to get a well-adapted metric on M sigma. And here are some of the ingredients that go into the proof. Um, so we want to, um, uh, 
uh, hold on a second. I just, let's go back here. Uh, so that's the Bordism theorem. And uh, what you want to do is apply the uh, gromov lawson bordism theorem, which I just looked at. That was it. Yeah. And we want to apply that first on the Bockstein and then on the interior. So going back to the picture here of what the bordism looks like. So you have this ordinary bordism from um, boundary M to boundary M prime, and then this is compatible with the LG fibered structure, so you get a bordism between the Bockstein's, and then you apply the gromov lawson theorem over there. So you push the metric across over there, and then you have to extend it. It's extended out over there, and that requires looking at surgery on the interior. And so that's basically how this uh, theorem goes. So uh, once you have the Bordism theorem, now here's the, uh, the way you prove the theorem. Suppose you have M sigma as in the main theorem with the two vanishing index obstructions. Now, the first condition was that alpha of beta M is equal to zero and dimension of beta M is greater than or equal to five. So then you can apply Stoltz's theorem to beta M and you know that this has a PSC metric. Now, under the two extra conditions in the main theorem, either L being a spin PSCG boundary or the class being zero, then that enables you pretty easily to construct a spin pseudomanifold that has an adapted PSC metric and has the same Bockstein uh, beta M. So, so you have this M prime that uh, has the same Bockstein. So if you subtract these two spin bordism classes, then by the long exact sequence, let me go back over here, you had, you had two things over here that went to the same thing over here, so they therefore come from something back there. So the difference between these lies in the image of I, in other words, it comes from some closed spin manifold, M double prime. But now the alpha invariant is additive. So uh, you can check, well, M prime has, M prime sigma has, uh, has a PSC metric. So alpha sil of M prime is equal to zero. Um, and then alpha of M has, alpha sil of M has to be equal to alpha sil of M prime plus alpha of M prime but alpha of M was equal to zero by assumption, and alpha of M, alpha sil of M prime was equal to zero, so therefore by the additivity of the alpha invariant, uh, alpha of M prime has to be zero, and then M prime also admits a positive scalar curvature metric. So now your M sigma is bordant just to the disjoint union of M double prime and M prime sigma. This thing has an adapted positive scalar curvature metric, because this, you have positive scalar curvature here, and you have Jonathan. positive scalar curvature over here, and the singularities are all in this component. So now you can apply the Bordism theorem and just take that metric and push it over to here, and you're done. So M double prime is uh, simply connected? The M double prime uh, is, uh, can be taken to be simply connected, yeah. Okay. Now, um, I'll just mention some uh, other stuff that we've been doing, which uh, isn't in the uh, paper that's already posted on the archive. This will be in the uh, SQL paper that's uh, about to come out. So we've been trying to understand the topology of the space of adapted PSC metrics. Um, assuming that that space is not empty and here is a very interesting fact about it. Uh, so here's the theorem. Suppose you have an M, M sigma, which is an LG fibered pseudomanifold as before. So there's a forgetful map where you just take your metric data on M sigma and you just attach the metric on beta M. And remember we said that if, 
M sigma and an adapted PSC metric, then the metric on beta M has to have positive scalar curvature. So you get a map like this. And if this space is non-empty, then the theorem says that this restriction map is surjective. That's not immediately obvious. Uh, and it has a non-canonical splitting, which is even much less obvious. In other words, given any uh, metric of positive scalar curvature on beta m, you can lift it back to a metric of positive scalar curvature up here, and you can do that in a way that sort of depends continuously on the metric. Um, so that tells you, since this map over here is split, that the homotopy groups of R plus of beta m inject into the homotopy groups of R plus of m sigma. The big advantage of that is that homotopy groups of R plus of beta m are just homotopy groups of R plus of a closed spin manifold, and that's something that's already been studied quite a bit. So there's a great deal of literature on that, and there are index methods that can be used to show that this thing has non-trivial topology. So, uh, for example, in many cases, it'll be disconnected and have complicated homotopy type. And here's, here's the basic idea. So there's a, uh, there's a rather amazing paper of Botvinnik, Ebert, and Randall Williams, which shows that if you have any closed uh, spin manifold, or not even closed, it also works for manifolds with boundary, then the space of positive scalar curvature metrics uh, maps to uh, something constructed out of KO, and this map is close to being surjective on homotopy groups. So that means that this thing has to have very complicated topology, uh, pretty much as complicated as KO. And um, then from that splitting result, you can take that and uh, push it back to get the fact that this thing has to have very complicated. So, as I said, you can apply that either with x equal to beta m, or you could apply it with x equal to the n sphere, and then just think of m sigma as being m sigma connected sum with a sphere, and by changing the metric on the sphere, you can sort of change the metric on the whole thing. And then that gives you a way to map uh, the homotopy groups of R plus of the sphere into here. And so that also can be used to show that the topology is rather complicated. So the, um, the upshot of all this is that uh, we know in many cases necessary and sufficient conditions for this space to be non-empty. And when it is non-empty, then uh, it probably has very complicated topology. Um, and uh, we have some sort of partial results about exactly what it looks like, but th this is sort of enough of a sketch to give you an idea. So uh, that was 50 minutes, so maybe I'll stop here and uh, people can ask questions. Uh, Jonathan, you started late. If you well, I sort of, I think, covered what I was planning to talk about. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, any any question or comments? So, I I suppose many much of the work can be extended to presence of fundamental groups. Yes. So in the, in, the, um, in the second paper that we're writing now, there are a lot of results that uh, include the case of a fundamental group that makes the surgery theorem more complicated and so on. But a lot of the same methods will work. Yes. Uh, any, any question? Any other question or comment? Okay, so let's thank Jonathan for a wonderful talk. Or maybe I. <laughs> 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 and uh, so I guess this is a, 
first Zoom seminar, but if you would like to give a talk or if you know someone who is interested in giving a talk, uh, you can send an email to Xiang or myself. Uh, the next speaker will be Boris Tegan from Northwestern. <laughs>